Tim, thank you for spending, well, this late evening with me to hopefully give our audience some tips into getting a role within the IT industry and especially with working with recruiters like yourself, but also to hear about why you chose a career in, in the technology industry, not necessarily from a technical point of view, but from recruiting for, for the technology industry in, in, as a whole. So thank you again for your time. But if you can go into who you are, what you do, that'd be fantastic as an intro. Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, good evening, Carl, first of all, and thanks for the opportunity. You know, it's uh, um, an area that I'm really passionate about and um, obviously set up a recruitment company four and a half years ago. But in a way of introduction, Tim Casemage, co-founder of Infraview. Um, yeah, we're a, uh, a specialist infrastructure and cloud technology recruitment company. Um, all we do is deliver technical consultants within the uh, MSP and IT solution provider space and uh, got into recruitment 16 years ago uh, for my sins. Um, I'd love to sit here and say, you know, I woke up one morning thinking recruitment's for me. It wasn't. That would be a complete and utter lie. Um, I come from a bit of a varied background, if I'm honest. Um, not that well educated. Um, you know, I finished school. Um, I was always very average um, at school. I was more about sport, rugby, and just trying to sort of uh, further my uh, sporting career, if you like. And uh, yeah, I, I left school and I become a landscape gardener for about, <laughs> for about four four or five years um done a bit of traveling and uh um yeah i think at one point the girlfriend i was with at the time said uh yeah i've had enough of you coming home looking all filthy and mucky and uh you know i want you to get a proper job um which at those days i think meant get a suit have a briefcase and uh, understand how to uh, send an email so uh i tried to get into recruitment um i failed uh for the first sort of four or five attempts um you know i just wasn't suited to that environment i didn't have the experience in terms of you know, uh, working, you know, within an office. Um, I knew nothing about recruitment apart from what people used to say to me. I think you'd be great at sales. You've got a big mouth, you talk a lot and you like earning money. So I was like, okay, cool. I'll give this a shot. Um, I kind of tried for about a year, didn't get into any of the city, if you like agencies and, uh, yeah, guy from the rugby club, uh, you know, ran a small recruitment company in Twickenham, uh, great guy. Um, you know, taught me from boy to man, if you like, in terms of the yeah, the, the, I suppose the recruitment process, back to basics, the fundamentals of, you know, what it takes to, you know, not only be a good consultant, but appreciate how hard you've got to work to get there. And uh, yeah, 16 years on running my own business, in for view, four and a half years in and uh, yeah, looking forward to the future. Yeah, no, that's a, it's an interesting story, right? I've had a few people say they started out landscape gardening or window cleaning and then yeah. someone told them to get a proper job, right? Like, like that actually means something uh, nowadays. I, I know. It's, crazy, it's right? Crazy. And, and yeah, I think I mean, uh, it, it was a good, look, I love landscaping, right? I come from a really creative background. Uh, my dad's an art director. My mum's a writer. She's got 12 books published and uh, I love being outdoors. Um, I think I was young at the time, right? I was, uh, um, there was, I didn't have much responsibility. It was kind of like, you know, earn the money, go down the pub, spend it, have a good laugh, hit nightclubs and uh, enjoy life. Um, but, you know, it was probably one of those things that um, I was anti being told, get a proper job. But at the same time, you know, once I did get involved into uh, the sort of world of recruitment, sales, targets and objectives and, you know, almost sort of being in control of your own destiny, I kind of sort of really fed onto that. Um, you know, I loved that opportunity to um, set a target, smash it. You know, that's my sort of background, if you like. And uh, yeah, no, it was good. It was enjoyable. <laughs> getting, the, getting the buzz of the win, right? And getting, getting to the point of being better than everyone else. Absolutely. You know, God, if you ask me, you know, what I was like back then, um, I'm a slightly different individual. I'm still ingrained with that sort of buzz of excitement of winning and being at the top. But um, yeah, I've got a different way of doing it these, you know, these days, if you like, I'm, I'm, I'm more about watching my staff and I get more excitement about seeing other people shine and flourish and progress opposed to, you know, trying to always sort of, you know, be at the top of the leaderboard. It's, it's more about, you know, if you like offering that experience and advice to other people to get them to that point. Um, yeah, I'm a strong believer of sort of there's a difference between a manager and a leader. You know, a manager sort of sets KPIs. A leader actually takes people and shows them how to achieve that KPI. And yeah, yeah I'm trying to portray that. Um, you know, 10 years ago, that wasn't me. <laughs> I'd knock <laughs> you out of the way to make sure that I was at the top of that board the whole time. <laughs> yeah, any dirty hand tactic you can find, just get it in there. <laughs> Absolutely. I've probably not time for this call on, uh, on, 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 on the video. But yeah, no, it was, uh, it was a bit of a dog dog eat dog world and uh look you come from that environment you know you wanted to you wanted to be the best right and uh you know unfortunately you just had to yeah keep pushing and driving forward to you know always be number one yeah definitely and so so why why technology is it in, in recruitment why not something else 
Good question. Um, you know, I wish I had a great answer for that, if I'm honest, in terms of, you know, uh, a background or, um, you know, a, a personal interest. And the truth is I didn't. Um, I think I can I, I look back now and I think because I knew nothing about technology, um, you know, in terms of I wasn't computer literate, I wasn't able to write emails back then 16, 18 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, it just wasn't me, you know, it wasn't my background. So that's probably what excited me because there was so much to learn. You know, I'm one of those guys that I'm like a sponge. I just want to absorb more and more information. And if I don't know something, I want to get to know it and I want to get to know it quick so that I can progress and move on and be better, if you like. And yeah, like I said, when I met a guy from, you know, the rugby club that run an IT recruitment company, um, you know, he you know, took me on board as a, as a junior and sort of trained and developed and progressed me. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, taught very early on, you know, build a niche, know it, learn it, and absolutely just continue to absorb as much information as you possibly can to, um, you know, the more information you have, the better you can be in that area. And, uh, and, and, and luckily I didn't step outside of it. You know, when I first started in it from a recruitment perspective, the first two years were quite generic, broad across infrastructure and software development. And then two years in, I just solely focused on infrastructure and obviously, you know, 16 years on, that's all I've ever done. So yeah, yeah I love it now from, rec- and I genuinely do, you know, I have a real passion for infrastructure and cloud from a technology perspective. Ask me to fit and uh, install a, a computer and I'll, I'll run away. <laughs> but ask me to talk about it and uh, I'll, I'll happily listen all day long. Fantastic. And what, what would you say is, is, is your finish line, right? So everyone says that there's this line in the sand and this marching band and parade and all that kind of stuff that goes on. What, what, what are you aiming for? Oh, God, in life or from in business? Both, really. What, 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 what drives you? God, what, family drive me. I've got two gorgeous boys, uh, Louis and JJ, a beautiful wife. Um, uh, so from a personal perspective, it's all about family. You know, I've been brought up that way. You know, my biggest inspiration is my father. You know, he's all about loyalty, honesty, integrity. And, uh, you know, he's provided for, you know, my mom and, you know, my brother from the age of 16 years old. So, you know, uh, for me, his family is absolutely key. Um, that's my big drive in terms to be the best version of myself from a business perspective. God, you know, I sit and talk about this with my business partner all the time. And our mission is to be known as the number one UK cloud and infrastructure technology recruitment company. So, um, is that the final finish line? Um, maybe if you're asking me on a different day, once I get to a point where I can send, sell for millions and get out as quickly as possible. <laughs> no, no, I, no, I want to build a business that is, uh, that, 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 that is fully functional, that is known, you know, that is experienced. And, you know, we are now labeled. I want to be labeled as the number one UK recruitment uh, technology cloud and infrastructure company out there. That, 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 when I've achieved that, then I'm going to look at other things, you know, whether it be personal interests or, you know, perhaps another uh, business adventure but right now my sole focus is building in yeah perfect yeah tim and tim the two tims the infraview <laughs> the infra the infra duo <laughs> <laughs> absolutely so what, what would you say your most memorable moment so far has been then in recruitment <laughs> cool. I'm gonna fr- I'm gonna fr- I'm gonna throw it out there. So probably. Uh, oh my god. Uh, so getting sprayed with a bottle of champagne in the open office on the eleventh floor of my last company, dressed as an elf, three <laughs> weeks before Christmas, when I uh, um, I hit eleven deals in one month. Fantastic. And I'm not saying that from an ego point of view because that wasn't the question. But it was the record that that company, one person had ever done. Anyway, 11 deals in one month, rung the bell 11 times. I was dressed as an elf. And one of the C-level individuals come over and sprayed me with a bottle of champagne. I was able to then leave that office at 10 to 11, go down the pub, and the rest is, uh, the rest is a whole new story. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, to be fair, that's, that's, that's quite an amusing thing, right? My, my, my plan now after this session is to try and find some kind of evidence of that image of you as an elf sprayed in champagne. <laughs> Perfect. I could probably help you, but I'll let you try and find it. <laughs> if you put something out on LinkedIn, there will be people that will discuss it. I'll just, I'll just give Tim a ring, you might find it. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, good moment, right? A memorable one. You know, I could sit here and say, you know, loads of other little sort of things. But for me right now, you know, what was memorable? You know, uh, yes, we've done record-breaking months. Yes, we went out for great lunch clubs. We built teams. You know, uh, you know, we, 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 you know, we brought on some fantastic clients. And to date, we've got some amazing relationships, you know, with some fantastic organizations that we've helped grow, you know, from 
you know, a, a five man band to a 20 man band from a, you know, 15 million pound company to a 60 million pound company and, you know, build divisions within multi billion pound organizations. But yeah, I mean, what's a memorable moment, you know, I'm still in recruitment 16 years on and that stands out, you know, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm a senior member of a business. And I'm getting sprayed with a bottle of champagne dressed as an elf after doing 11 <laughs> deals. Yeah. It sticks. <laughs> <laughs> but on, on the flip of that, what would you say the, the biggest mistake you've made is and the lesson you learned from it? My biggest mistakes was putting work before my children at some yeah. point in my yeah. career. And that's a fairly common thing we've heard across the other sessions is, is sacrificing family and friends and the things you'd like to do potentially for, for that, that deal, that, that evening phone call with a customer that's struggling with something like that kind of scenario. And I still struggle with that today, if I'm honest, Carl. I'll be honest, you know, it's something that I work on. Um, you know, I believe that it's all a mindset thing, you know, uh, you know, that ability to click off. Um, I work a lot around sort of meditation and, you know, that peace of mind and that relaxation. You know, I'm 100 miles per hour, you know, you know, I, I mean, I'm up at half five every single morning. I'm in the gym by half six. I train for an hour and a half. I'm first in the office you know, generally sort of last out and, uh, you know, I love what I do, you know, and, uh, but, but I've still to date got to check myself, you know, when I actually walk in, you know, my home, you know, and I've got a wife that has been there looking after two kids or doing the school runs and all that kind of stuff. And I've got two kids that need my attention. Right. Um, and, and, and I'm a big believer it's about being present, you know, um, and, and that's something that I'm working on still today. You know, yeah, I think I can, I can, I can definitely, uh, relate to that to a degree, right? Because I'm used to being away from home two, three, four nights a week, generally. Um, Mrs. Is, is, is running everything day to day at home and then I'm just, yeah. well, I'm, like, I'm treating it like a hotel, right? I'm yeah, coming and going absolutely. and doing what I need to do to provide food on the table, heating, shelter, all that kind of stuff. And actually there's more to it than that. There's being present when you're at home. And I think one of the things that this, I think it was a, a Facebook post or something that I saw a few months back where, there was a, a picture of a kid playing, I think it was on the floor with the toys and stuff and asking their, their dad for help. And he was just sat there on his phone. Yeah. Doing on Facebook or whatever. And I think there's an element where I'm, I'm a true believer that every home now should have a Faraday box, right? A little metal box that you put your mobile phone in, your tablet, your technology, shut yeah. it, has a timer on it, and you can't get access to it for an hour a day at least. So it forces yeah. you as a family to focus on each other rather Absolutely. than on, on your make believe friends on Twitter and Facebook and whatever else it might be. I totally agree you know and 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 you know when we actually do that how better is that experience right you know whether it be you know playing a ball game whether it be kicking a ball about in the garden whether it be just sitting around having dinner you know when your phone is not there not on or you know in the other room yeah just suddenly that whole atmosphere that environment that communication that bond between you know family kids partners loved ones whatever it's just a far better experience and uh yeah it's important you know and it's something that i need to remind myself of you know because uh uh, you know, I find it difficult, you know, certainly when, you know, we work in a busy environment, right. You know, certainly from a recruitment perspective, it doesn't sleep. There's always something going on. Yeah. So actually we need to look at ourselves even more so and say, look, we can't solve it today or we can't do everything in one day. And uh, yeah, something yeah. that I'm working on myself, but yeah, it's, it is about, you know, that, that, that quality of time. And when we do click off, make sure we're fully clicked off. Otherwise what's the point, right? If we're half in and half out, you know, actually it's pointless and you're not doing anything, you're, you know, half working, but not doing that well. And you're not yeah. spending time your family and you're just not present therefore it will get picked up on so yeah yeah happy wife happy life right so. a absolutely <laughs> yeah no indeed indeed and sometimes about asking them you know uh, god i mean it's one of those things right you know how are things going you know don't be afraid to do that you know often do we actually ask our wife you know if they're not right at the moment are you happy or is everything going well and you know the kids you know is it all yeah. right you know it's little things like that yeah definitely definitely so kind of like changing it a little bit right so we, we've heard about interview we've heard about yourself and how you've progressed the um the business and all those kind of things so let's think about candidates right and, and people going for interviews so preparing for for that big job that you want to get into right what would your what would your tips be i love this area um god you know so so it's something that i've rolled out for many many years um you know throughout my recruitment career and uh god where shall i start so I, i'm a strong believer there's three key areas you know uh, and, and i'll try and sum them up and if i talk too much tell me to shut up or butt in and get me to sort of either stop talking about that area or, or elaborate <laughs> on another one but yeah three key areas right um and 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 the first one is know the company but more importantly know the industry okay so you kind of think that if someone's going for that particular job 
they will do their research. Okay, fine. Or they're interested in that particular organization or, you know, that environment. And, uh, you know, I'm a strong believer of, you know, it's, it's about passion, enthusiasm, personality, character. That's got to shine throughout the whole interview. But, you know, when you're looking at doing your research about the business, you know, look at what the company does, you know, look at their journey, where have they come from and where are they looking to be? Or at least what is your interpretation of where that company is right now and how they're positioned in the market? Um, you know, what's their background? What's their achievement? What's their partnership status? You know, I'm going to highlight areas that is most relevant to interview, right? Because that's our experience of preparing those candidates. But, you know, don't recite the word or don't recite the, 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 the company word for word. It's not about that. You know, it's about being human. You know, um, God, in that area, I would definitely say, you know, uh, talk about recent wins, talk about relevant company success stories and show a genuine interest in that organization and where they sit within the industry. Yeah. Um, God, part two, um, this sounds really silly, but I say it to every single candidate. Know your CV inside and out, top to bottom, bottom to top. You know, as far as I'm concerned, and this is what I say to every single candidate, when we send your CV or when that client receives your CV, that is the only thing they've had so far to make a decision if they want to see you, okay? Yeah. Yes, the agent or the internal recruiter or whoever has sent that CV will look to speak to that manager and do the best they can to give a bit of a high-level sell of you, your personality, your character. But effectively, they are receiving this CV along with others, and they are reading through that, um, uh, you know, that CV from top to bottom. They're going to go over it again. They're probably going to pass it over to someone else. They're going to have a slightly different eye. So, you know, my advice is know everything that's on there. So education, qualifications, um, experience, project, technology, and think about the success stories around each part of your CV, okay? So little things like success and failures. I love the word, give me an example of where you failed. Be prepared for that. You know, that is my tip because it will come up. And I say to my candidates, use that as an advantage because I'm a big believer when you fail, you've got an opportunity to grow. You can turn that negative into a positive. So, you know, in summary, if you like, know your CV inside and out, top to bottom, bottom to top, but understand you know, um, that this individual that is, you know, this interviewer, if you like, is looking at a bit of paper that you've written. So you should know it. Absolutely. Anything that's on there, they have the right to ask you. So yeah, there's nothing worse than being asked about a particular technology that you know, but you just haven't sort of recapped or refreshed in your own mind because it's a particular technology that you used yeah. in aggression a few years back. So in summary, know your CV inside and out, top to bottom, bottom to top, you know, and uh, um, again, Something else is important. Generally now, you're being interviewed by more than one person. So there's someone that leads it and directs the question based on looking at your CV, but the other person will be scanning through and they may pick something out that is very much in your earlier career that you may have forgotten. So they could just come out with that. Oh, I know so you work for X company. I used to know so-and-so there. What was your involvement? Nothing worse than suddenly you have a mind blank or you just aren't able to give a decent answer around that. Yeah. Next bit for me is um, make sure you know the role. Honestly, you'd be surprised. Some people go to interviews. I hear these horror stories where they've just taken a job spec from an agent or, you know, they've been sent the job spec two days before and the interview's been arranged for them. Crazy. You know, you're representing yourself in a very incestuous industry, certainly from an MSP solution provider space. Everyone knows everyone these days. Or they are able to get a recommendation or referral about yourself. So from my perspective... You know, read the JD. If you don't understand it, if you don't know enough about it, push back. Mm -hmm. Ask that agent. It's that agent's job to give you as much information as they have to give you the opportunity to go and sell yourself or, you know, um, at least engage with that interviewer at a high level and understanding of that role and that opportunity. Yes, you're going to get the opportunity to ask more questions and, you know, it's a platform and it's a two-way thing and you're going to want to know more about it and you will know more about it when you get to that interview. Yeah. But yeah, my advice, if you've just got a job spec and you're just working off a job spec without any detailed information about how this individual will sit fit and, you know, progress within that company... Um, yeah, if you're not comfortable, um, I would definitely push back and make sure that you've got enough information to be able to at least go in there and understand the role or at least your interpretation of what you've been given. And then there's close. Close on a positive note. You know, I, I, I love this bit. when I, I get excited now, honestly, when I prepare my candidates on this. I get really excited. I go, look, at the end of it, right? Or when the opportunity should arise, if you're asked, you know, what else do you want to know? Or if you've got any questions, 
ask them if there's any more information that they need or require, or is there anything else that, um, that, that, that you should elaborate on or highlight? Because most likely, I, I say to my guys and girls that, you know, if you're enjoying in you, if you're bought in, you, you get that vibe, right? You get that buzz, you get that feeling, you can feel that, you know, that things are going well, you know, and, you know, there's nothing worse than walking out of that interview and thinking, oh, oh, why didn't I let them know that I'm interested? Because you could be up against two, three or more. Yeah. Um, and I always turn around and say, look, you know, tell them you're excited. Tell them you're instantly engaged when you first read the job spec or heard about the opportunity and had that initial telephone call. And actually now having sort of, you know, uh, met yourself or, you know, you've heard more about the opportunity, finish and summarize and say, look, based on what I've heard right now, uh, meeting yourself, meeting the team, understanding more about the role, the opportunity, the company, the progression, the development, I'd love to join. You know, that sort of summarizes and finishes and, yeah, showcases your excitement and enthusiasm. And, and for me, I think the market personally is driven by personality and character. You know, technology and experience can be gained and taught, right? But, yeah. you know, if you're not the right individual and you're not showing that passion and enthusiasm, yeah, you might not get the job. And I think picking on a few of those points, right, it's like CV. Right? So I've gone through, oh, well, I've gone to many interviews and I've also interviewed many people to come into roles. Yeah. And I think... If I think about when I'm looking at a CV when it comes across across my desk, I'm looking and thinking, well, what's what's different in this CV compared to what I have in my existing team? So if you're going yeah. to be joining an existing team, maybe do some research into that organization and who runs it. So if you get my name as an example, go on LinkedIn and see who works in my team. See who's there, what skills they've got, what value you can bring, the gaps you're going to bridge, all that kind of stuff. But then the other thing that, that from a CV perspective, it sometimes grinds my gears a little bit is when people put they might as well just put a hashtag keyword thing across their entire CV of, of technologies they don't actually have a clue about, right? Exactly. Just to be picked up on. And I think I've had it in the past where candidates have had um, DevOps, right? I'm going to pick on that for the moment. At the top of their CS, that's the first thing in skills, right? Yeah. If that's not your strong area, don't put it as the first thing on your CV, right? Exactly. And I think for me, there's a lot of people at the moment that are trying to get into those kind of DevOps style roles, or they want to be able to show how they can do app modernization, containerization, agile based project management, all those kind of things that fall into that DevOps culture. But then as soon as you start asking those kind of questions, what does DevOps mean to you and things? And it just regurgitate a dictionary edition. They don't know it. It's not it. I mean, um, by all means, put an interest of upskilling and learning across DevOps or, you know, the next gen skill within an area that you've specialized in for the last X, Y, and Z years. Absolutely. But, you know, for me, what do you specialize in? What are your key strengths? What are you able to bring to that company? That is what should shout out on your CV, you know, which is aligned to the job that hopefully you're going to get, right? I think the other thing to that, though, right, is a lot of people, so I remember there's a statistic somewhere, and you've probably seen this one uh, as well, around the difference between a, a male going for a job role and a female going for a job role, where the males will just go where the... I don't know, they've got maybe 60% of the skills that are required, but they'll give it a go. Whereas a female may actually look at it and go, well, I'm not the right, the right person for that role. I don't have all the things and then don't apply. Um, I remember seeing some kind of statistic on that uh, a few months back. But the thing for me is, is that there's one thing that I look for outside of the technical capability, and that is the attitude of the individual that's coming into the room. Absolutely. Because the attitude you're never going to change, especially at, at a specific age, right, where you've you, you've already had it ingrained into you who you are and the attitude you've got and, and at that point as an individual when they come in the room they might be the best technical person that you've ever met in your life but if they're not going to fit into the culture and the ethos of your team and all that kind of stuff then they're never going to get the job anyway so i think totally the right agree. attitude and learn the technology is a good way to go carl i mean i couldn't agree more you know i i you know when i used the phrase earlier you know personality character is absolutely essential, you know, and, uh, you know, we're not asking for anyone to be anyone they're not, right? You know, at the end of the day, that's never going to work and no one's ever going to lie or pretend to be someone that they're not because they're just going to get found out. But look, you know, if you're passionate, if you're enthusiastic, you know, if you want to be bought into, uh, you know, if you're excited about the vision, the technology, the journey, the, you know, all this kind of stuff. For me, I think personally, I think, like I said earlier, the market is driven by personality and character. You know, if you come from the right background technically, but you're showing the right desire and you've got the right drive and you want to, you know, do you know, I, I love this, right? I always use this, no job too small, no job too big, right? You know, they're the sort of guys that are what I call long-term hires. They're the guys that are going to exceed expectation. They're the guys that are going to shine and separate themselves from the run-of-the-mill guys that 
I'll do that tomorrow. If it doesn't get fixed, we'll work it out tomorrow. You know, we want the drivers, you know, we want people that are, you know, really bought into going the extra mile. Um, yeah, I love what you say. Absolutely. You know, personality carriage is so important. You know, people that are genuinely bought in and what, you know, excited about what they do. Yeah. And I think on the other thing, right. Is, is, and it sounds really weird to put it this way, but, but be a creep before you go to that, 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 that session, right. Facebook stalk, social media stalk, find out the kid, the person that's interviewing you, find out what's interest, right. Cause one of the things that I kind of look for is, is how much have you done the homework? How much effort have they put in before this session? Because that shows the kind of effort they're willing to put in once they've maybe been hired. Yeah. And also the rapport you're going to build with someone is built within less than 90 seconds. Yeah. If you can find that one thing that you might have as a similarity that you can draw upon in that interview process, straight away you're on a level playing field from a conversation perspective. You're not on the back foot thinking, well, this guy doesn't like me. When actually they might like you, they just might be playing a poker face. Yeah. So there's those kind of things as well. And I think um, I remember reading a book on this, this how to, it doesn't know how to make friends and alienate people ultimately, but it's this the concept of that you get a, you can build a rapport within 90 seconds and the the tells and the ticks and the things that you do is not the verbal language, it's the the non-verbal concept. So it's the posture, it's your body, it's your tone, it's the, the level of volume in your voice, the empathy that you're putting into the conversation. Mm. Are you actively listening or are you looking around the room thinking, what the hell am uh, I doing here? Right. It, exactly. That body language, you know, are you connecting, are you engaging? And you know, are you genuinely looking enthused? about what that interviewer is talking about you know it's uh yeah no i agree you know what it's one of those ones you know we talk about that cv and that experience and stuff and it was like one of my tips is uh um you know make the most of when they say tell me about you <laughs> tell me about yourself you'd be surprised right it's like well you know do you want those notes on that bit of paper to be well i have two pets a dog a budgie I've got three kids and, you know, I play in a band and I'm the lead drummer. That, that, that's all great. And that's later on in the interview when we talk about personal interest. But when an interviewer turns around and says, you know, tell me about yourself, that is your opportunity to absolutely showcase your experience, your technical capability, your project experience. You know, it's, it's, it's like, I don't know, you know, what would you rather? Like I said, you know, the notes to be around, you're a band guy, you know, you like playing football on the weekend, you got two kids, great, 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 which is important, which is which is brilliant. Or would you rather, you know, uh, would you rather, you know, uh, your strengths and, and, and why that company should hire you on that notes? For me, I know exactly what I think, you know, that individual should have on there. You know, it's like, it's, it's about be assertive, you know, take responsibility. Um, yeah you know, for that interview without being overpowering, you know, it's a two way thing. It's uh, Oh God, how do I explain it? it <laughs> it's like a dance with your partner, mm -hmm. right? You know, you work together and you both respond to each other, right? You know, that's how we could sort of say it. the interview is like, you know, be responsible, take accountability, you know, but yeah, you know, at the end of the day, it's a two way thing. You know, there's one of those ones where I remember saying to a candidate, um, I think it was Monday, you know, a big senior guy, um, you know, going for a big sort of multi-million pound organization, step up. And I was kind of like, he was like, you know, what should I say? What should I do? You know, should I jump this? Should I jump that? And I was getting a bit worried about with some of his questions, if, if, mm -hmm. if I'm honest. And I was kind of like, don't wait for the interview to ask, um, you know, what your noble prize is. You know, you know, you know, showcase it. You know, there's nothing worse than walking out of that interview feeling, oh, I should have mentioned that. You know, it's it's like feel satisfied that you showcase your strengths and experience and you've given that, you know, solid accountability of yourself and what you can bring and what you can offer to that, you know, to that customer within that role. You know, be proud. I think one of the other things from my point of view is is and I've done this myself, right? And even when I came for my interview process with, with CDW where I am now and I'm still there lo loving life, right? Doing what I do best. Yeah. But then I think from when I, when I went for that interview process and I was interviewed by three people and then I, I, I sat down with the CTO of Kelway as it was when I joined uh, yeah. Andy Eccles. And, yeah, I know Andy well. And I remember having this conversation and it was all very personal stuff. Like, what do you get up to outside of it? There's nothing, never anything technical, right? Because as far as he was concerned, everyone else had asked those questions. Right? So he wanted to know me as an individual. And then right at the end of the interview, he asked me the question of, so what is it you want to get to in your career? What's your goal? And I, I know what I knew what the answer was. And I knew what I wanted to say, but what I said did not come out the way I wanted it to. Right. Right. The answer that came out of my mouth was, "I want your job, basically." <laughs> right. Which should have been, "I want to aspire to be some into a position like yourself, a technology leader." Right. Yeah. 
not I'm I want to steal your job basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, that, yeah. that straight away makes someone depending did, on did the individual, laugh? they sit there and they go, hmm. Or they sit there and go, he's got he's got balls, right? He's, yeah. <laughs> he's gonna go. So it can work both ways. But I think Andy yeah, must have liked it though. I think that's going to be something I'm going to pick up. So hopefully Andy's going to be on this ep- on this series in a few weeks' time. Brilliant. And I'm going to ask him what his thoughts of me were when he interviewed me initially because I've I've heard rumours of what they may or may not have been. <laughs> so get get the the words from the horse's mouth. Uh, I, I love you. I, I love you mentioned that right because it's like, God, I, I was going to mention uh, you know practice and prepare right. If I was going to give anything on this video, it'd be practice and prepare for exactly what you just described there because you know it's it's. It, it's all very well when someone asks you, why should I hire you saying it in your head? But it's a whole different game yeah. when saying it out loud, right? So prepare, practice, you know, you are going to be asked that question, okay, in a slightly different way. But at the end of the day, they are going to say, why should I hire you? Or, um, you know, what would you be able to bring to this opportunity or you know what separates you from the others or you know what's your strengths what your weaknesses oh my god great question right everyone can talk about their strengths because they're kind of geared up because you know they've been prepped by the agent or you know they've spoken to someone that's really good at interviews and they've talked about highlight your skills your experience and that's your strengths but the weakness it's the famous question that no one likes to answer but be prepared for it practice and prepare anything you're unsure of or makes you feel uncomfortable in your head it might sound great say it out loud practice and prepare because it will probably sound a lot different when you say it out loud than it does in your head so yeah you might have to uh go back to school again and and and, and literally practice and prepare certainly around the areas that you know are a little bit uncomfortable because who wants to highlight a weakness right you instantly start thinking god if i say my weakness is too much then am i going to do myself out of this job but you know there is a way around getting that you know weaknesses are important to highlight so you know you can you know showcase that you're aware of a weakness then you are working on improving it right um but yeah god it's it's, it's crazy yeah i think i think the other thing for me is, is like the candidates that you can get sometimes that are looking at stepping up right so let's take it to position that i've been in with pre-sales right architecture design that kind of work and your role is partially sales mostly technical and you've got to be able to articulate you've got to be able to whiteboard you've got to be able to dumb things down potentially and all those kind of things right and the thing for me is if you're stepping up from say a consultancy role where you're used to just getting your headset on with music and sitting there typing away and doing your job that's fantastic yeah. you're brilliant at that but if you're going to come for an interview where you're going into like a, a customer facing role that's more salesy prepare your whiteboarding techniques right absolutely walk up to that whiteboard with confidence pick up the pen draw your diagram talk people through it and be happy to defend right and if you've made a decision on something during that interview process let's say someone says to you can you draw me a diagram for x y and z and you go yeah sure i can walk up draw it out and then when you start questioning it what they're not questioning for is whether you're right or wrong the question for you to defend what you've done absolutely confident in the reason you're confident rather than yes. just sitting there and going oh um yeah sorry i shouldn't have done that and scribbling it out because that's not the answer because then you're not decisive you're not going to be to guide customers on the journey or anything along those lines certainly i mean look absolutely from a pre-sales solution architecture perspective you know you're the glue between tech and sales right you know you're going there you know advising around that technical solution you know you're gathering requirements you're producing high level solution design proposals documentations and yeah, yeah when you go and present that solution based on the information you've gathered you know, suddenly you're in a room full of all different people, tech and non-technical individuals, if they're pulling you apart and then suddenly you find yourself changing this, changing that, no one's going to feel confident that, you know, the solution one you put together is actually going to add value. And two, you know, you could be changing paths all at different stages of the actual implementation or whatever, you know? So yeah, like, absolutely, you know, be confident, you know, be able to, you know, deliver the solution that you're confident in, in the area that you specialize in, but more importantly, take ownership of the room, right? It's certainly from a presentation point of view, but be engaging. You know, I always say this, you know, it's engaging and pulling people that perhaps aren't technical. If you're doing a technical presentation, you've got to think that, you know, not everyone within that room is always as technical as the next person. So it's about being able to demonstrate that in a technical and non-technical way for individuals that still need to feel part of that presentation. Yeah, and I think there's always that that common question that people are going to ask, which is how have you um, adapted to a challenge or managed your way out of a challenge or worked with a conflicting individual or all those kind of usual conversations right? that generally happen? And I think everybody has a really basic answer for that. They go on Google if they've never had to do it before and they find the answer and they go, right, the answer is 
to say that I sat with the individual and talked to them and came to an understanding and compromised and blah, 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 which is fantastic. But that's not actually what happened, is it? No, yeah, exactly. The actual way yeah. it happened is, is that guy blamed you for something. You blamed them. You didn't come to an agreement. You didn't talk to each other for three months and then finally have to get back in the room together. <laughs> that's the actual story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And how honest do you be, right, in that interview? Good question. Yeah. How honest do you actually be? I mean, there's a way of articulating that. And actually, for me, I think it's about being totally honest and upfront and giving a live situation of how you dealt with it. But more importantly, what you learned from that, because that interviewer will respect the fact you're honest and upfront and actually gave a true life, real situation that, yeah, do you know what? There was a dispute. I wanted this. He wanted that. She thought it would be better this way. And actually, we clashed. You know, we didn't have this big fight in the office and it didn't become absolutely ridiculous. But yeah, you know, we did have a, a time apart, shall we say, in terms yeah. of, you know, uh, uh, agree to disagree. But, you know, actually, I think the interviewer will respect the fact that you've done that. But what he will, what he or she will want, that interviewer will want to know how you overcome that and what you've done differently next time. Yeah. That will be resolve re that conflict, right? How did you get back on speaking terms or bring them absolutely. back on the page? That communication the ability to deal all different levels of authority you know it's like i suppose that respected but be liked sort of situation you know um yeah. and that's really important in every environment you know because you know one bad egg you know could really really destroy a whole in a whole division a whole environment you know and that's yeah. what it goes back to what we we're saying earlier right you know personality character culture fit you know someone that's bought into you know teamship you know someone that will go the extra mile will you know sometimes take that criticism on the board you know on the chin if you like and, 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 and try and come back with a solution or, yeah. you know, at least have a discussion around potentially what could work opposed to just accepting the first answer. Yeah, definitely. And, and on that kind of concept of knowing your, you, the people you're engaging with, right? So I was speaking with Peter Ely from, from Bytes earlier on one of these sessions, and he was saying that when he first started out in his career, he's working for an insurance company in the city. Um, he basically was a junior support engineer ultimately. And he went yeah. into his room to fix a projector for, for this, high level exec member in the in the in the business and this guy in front of the customer was having a having a pop at him about getting it sorted quicker and quicker right and, uh, his answer there wasn't just to be quiet and get it done his answer is at the time when he was younger and a little bit more emotional um was to was to bite back yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was the worst thing and i think even in the interview process right if if the inter if the interview is pushing you for something that you're not willing to give just sit there and go i'm sorry i don't want to talk about that or yeah. I don't want to engage on this element. This is not something I don't feel comfortable doing. And show that you've got your ethics and your morals and all those kind of things as well. Because yeah. some people do play this in a, it's a bit of a game, right? I've been in interview processes where people have sat there and gone, asked you questions that you, you know are nothing to do with what you're joining the organization for. And they're trying to tease out a, a bit of emotion or a knee-jerk reaction to something, see how you handle something. And yeah. I'm going to be in an interview process where, uh, I'm not going to mention the reseller's name, but, the individual sat across the room from me and, and we got got on well and there's various people in the room and then all of a sudden at the end he goes right i've got a few things for you to think about if you want to join our organization i'm like okay cool yeah that's fine i don't want you to wear an earring i was like okay i could may maybe look at removing that um i don't want and the next thing was the one that threw me off was don't wear cheap white shirts i can see no way right so i was like right okay you need to be clean shaven. I'm and at the time, <laughs> and at the time, I had a beard, right? And he's like, "You have to be clean shaven." I was like, okay. And he goes, um, "And you're going to be in the office four days a week as a minimum." I was like, right, "Okay, that's fine. I can probably meet a lot of that stuff." And then I sat there and I was like, "I don't want this job, and I don't want to work here." And he was like, "What? Well, can I ask why?" And I went, "Because you're imposing on me now what you would like me to do, and I've not even signed a contract with you. Yeah. Once I've signed that contract, what else are you going to ask of me?" Absolutely. I feel uncomfortable doing so. I think we can call it quits and I won't join this organization. And that's pretty yeah. much how it went. And I'm fairly glad that I didn't join there, to be fair. Absolutely. Well, but if it again, started like that, it's true to yourself, right? That's the main thing. I mean, uh, it's absolutely, yeah. Be you, be true, right? You know, it's the only way. It's, uh, it reminded me of uh, when, I, when I had an uh, interview many, many years ago, you know, when I. So when I first started out in recruitment, like I said earlier, I had a small company based in, uh, in Twickenham. It was fantastic. Training was great. It was really old school, you know, very thorough, process-driven. 
um, you know, sort of there six years. Um, and uh, when I was thinking about leaving, I did have another interview with another company that was slightly more advanced and had a great website and offices all over. And I was sitting getting, you know, all excited about it. And I remember I'd done this first stage and it was all about numbers, figures, how much you're going to bring, what clients. And I was a bit taken back, if I'm honest, because, you know, at the time I was running a contract division and uh, or a contract book of sort of 50 odd runners. And, you know, I was a young guy earning lots of money and, and it was great. But suddenly I'm in this meeting room and this lady's going, right, what's the margin? What's the GP? How many clients can you bring? And I was a bit like, oh, you know, trying to think off my feet. And um, I sort of passed that first stage. And then this guy came in and uh, um, sort of crossed his legs, swung his chair around. And uh, he said, tell me how you deal with this situation. And I was giving this example and I went, and then I would touch base. And he went, I'm going to stop you there. That will be the last time you ever use the word touch base. And I was like, do you know what? I, I, you know, I, was, I, was, I was a bit younger than I went, I'm done. Not for me. <laughs> Thanks for your time. I'm off. I, you know, like you said, if that is how you were going to be spoken to, you know, or at least addressed at interview, imagine when you work for the person, yeah. if they're having a bad day, <laughs> you're yeah. going to be shouting, yeah. screamed at. Honestly, and I've worked at organisations right, where you've had people shouting at you and you've got spit down the side of your face because yeah. something's not working. And it's not a nice environment to be in. That being said, looking back into my, in, where I've been in those organisations, those situations, I probably did my best work. <laughs> right, yeah, sure, yeah. Right? I think that's probably under duress and fear. Um, yeah. I've definitely done my best work, but it isn't the kind of culture and environment you want to stay not in. Not sustainable, right? You know, no one can work at that level under those circumstances, in those situations, day in and day out, you know? It kind of builds you, and, and, and I think sort of, I, I don't know, unearthed and that inner strength that, do you know what, when the shit hits the fan and you just got to get down and dirty and just literally go that extra mile and get it done and everyone's screaming and shouting, you've got, you know, deadlines and, and, and you kind of sort of sit back and go, at the end of the day, yeah. the early hours in the morning, I've achieved that. That's great, you know, but you can't do that every day. No. It's not nice. No one deserves to work in that environment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the same thing, any more top tips from, from Kaz, right? Any more things that you've got for people? Quick, snappy, top three tips. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah, so top tips. So snappy. Uh, so oh God, we covered it. Make sure you're pre well, well prepared. Uh, know who you're interviewing with. Um, make sure you've done your research. Scope them out. Check their backgrounds. Um, and then the three areas that I mentioned earlier. Know the, know the company. Know your CV. Yeah. Do your research. Um, God. Actually, do you know what? What's probably right relevant in this in, in this current climate? You know, when we're doing videos, don't take that for advantage. Don't, don't take that for granted, because you know. And I hate using the word "it's the new norm," but right now, mm. every interview is being done via video. So you know, again, that is a representation of not necessarily how you look, but it is how prepared you are. That's really, really important, right? You know, um, and no one's going to sit there in their boxer shorts, lying down in their bed, right? I get that, but you know. We are humans, and unfortunately, we judge. Yeah. So if you are just sitting there in a rubbish old T-shirt at your interview going for a top-leading role... Yeah, with wallpaper you know, coming off your wall and all that yeah, kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you know, we are in that world right now, and irrelevant of COVID, um, you know, I think we're going to see videos more and more, you know, in every part, every aspect of, of, of business. Um, you know, from an interview perspective, it's great. I think it sort of sorts that first stage out, mm -hmm. um, gets people engaging on a, on a, on a, on a much more personable level um, before arranging, you know, people to meet and stuff. But yeah, so absolutely, you know, right now adapt to where we're at, you know, video interviewing is the way forward right now. It's what everyone's doing. So make sure you're presentable, make sure you're, uh, you know, God, make sure the sound works, make sure the technology <laughs> around you, you know, yeah. uh, I'm the worst at that. You know, my business partner is brilliant. You know, before this call, God, I had to be like, Oh my God, my phone looks like a headset looks like it's not truly <laughs> charged. You know, but it's something that I need to do. I need to prepare for that and make sure that, you know, halfway through this call, this video, my headset doesn't go and my screen starts falling apart. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. So let's go on to some lightning questions, right? Some fun questions. Okay. So, oh my gosh. Last technology purchase you made? Uh, a headset. Perfect. And I've got yeah. it on right now. <laughs> Your biggest inspiration? Uh, my father. Good. Uh, what does work-life balance mean to you? Everything. I think it's important to create that in any environment, any size, any type of company. What did you want to do when you finished school? Uh, PE teacher. <laughs> That's what Joe Wicks want to be. 
<laughs> yeah, PE, well, yeah, I mean, Joe Wicks wasn't around then, but yeah, when I was at school. But yeah, absolutely. PE teacher, and then five years on for that, uh, a fireman. But didn't do either. Went into recruitment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's your favourite book? Uh, oh, God. Uh, my favourite book, uh, Tools of Titans. Yeah, that's a good book. Uh, most important thing to you? God. Okay, so I'm going to say family. Yeah. Everyone but does. if you ask me what is the most important per- thing in, in, in an individual, I would say honesty and integrity. Perfect. Uh, what would your words of wisdom be if it was a tweet? Uh, always remain teachable. <laughs> Fill in the blank. The new normal is? Get stuck in. <laughs> Favourite song? Miss American Pie. Must watch TV show. Oh my words! These are shit. These are right. Uh, must <laughs> must watch Friends. And favorite junk food? Pizza. Pizza. Good answer. Well, I think on that final pizza note, maybe we can call call that a wrap. Really, yeah. Thank you very much for your time. It's been fantastic. Uh, it's been brilliant. Honestly, I really, really appreciate you asking me, mate. And uh, look, we've known each other for many, many years. And uh, you know, if I can help in any way, um, I love what you're doing right now massively inspirational and uh yeah mate brilliant thank you so much